He's the editor of the monthly Alternate Perceptions online magazine, apmagazine.info, which began as a small newsletter called Peri-Ufology Forum back in 1985. Brent is the author of Visitors from Hidden Realms and On the Edge of Reality. Brent has lectured from coast to coast and has appeared on Coast to Coast AM, the Gene Steinberg Show, the Paracast, Tim Beckley is exploring the bazaar and many, many others. He hosts his own radio show as well as, as well for alternate perceptions. Brent has visited 21 states investigating UFO reports, including Ontario, Canada. His primary focus is reports of close encounter and contact experience and investigating the parapsychological and psycho-spiritual components of those experiences. Brett Raines has a chapter entitled, An Overview of the History of Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, Contact Paradigms, that was published in the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrial and Extraordinary Experiences, Massive Volume, Beyond UFOs, the Science of Consciousness and Contact with Non-Human Intelligence in 2018. And today he will be talking about that book, John A. Keel, the man, the myths, and the ongoing mysteries. Please welcome Brent Raines. Thank you very much, we appreciate it. And uh, I've been at this for going on 53 years in January. Um, I don't know, I don't think I would still be pursuing the, the UFO beat if it wasn't for John Keel. Um, Initially, I was drawn into the, the UFO field because of the possibility simply of maybe there are extraterrestrial visitations, which is the most popular uh, mainstream view uh, by, held by many still. But more and more now, we're seeing that some of Keel's uh, ideas about the possibility of uh, quantum physics, a parallel world, uh, that uh, some of these things are kind of an apparitional or, or uh, maybe even something similar to uh, some kind of projections like hologram. Also the, the paranormal elements that, that Keel had, uh, had written about back in 67 and in, into the early 70s. Uh, he was criticized extensively uh, for presenting such ideas and, and uh, some people even accused him of making this stuff up. Uh, I came to Point Pleasant myself in, in, uh, back in May of 1976 uh, the mystery wasn't at that time just quite, you know, uh, 10 years old. Uh, it began, in, you know, in, in, as many of you already know, in uh, December of 1966 with an incident at the uh, TNT plant where uh, Roger and, and Linda Scarberry and another young couple were there and suddenly they encountered what they called the, uh, later became called the Mothman. It was actually people were calling it the bird, but very unusual bird that was uh, about uh, six or seven feet tall and had these large, you know, um, wingspan and, and chased after this, uh, these, this, these people, uh, Ken Redmond, uh, down 62 into town. And, and uh, reportedly, Roger Scarberry had the car, his Chevy, I think 57 Chevy, revved up to about 100 miles an hour. And uh, this thing was just flying right over the top of their, came to fly right over the top of their, uh, their car. And they could actually see the one wing on one side and one wing on the other side flapping. And uh, they went straight to uh, talk to the police when they got into town. And that was where it began. Uh, Keel was a, long, a journalist who had long been interested in unusual subject matter. He, but he was also quite, a, quite skeptical he had uh, been over to many parts of uh, uh, the Orient, the East, of Tibet, and uh, uh, India, and, and Egypt, and uh, Singapore, and places to, uh, he, you know, was very interested in, in other cultures, and interested in uh, a lot of different belief systems. He was actually an amateur magician going back to his childhood. Uh, he came to be respected by many uh, professional magicians, and uh, he, though skeptical, he, uh, and he, when he went over to India, there were a lot of, uh, a lot of people who were uh, 
trying to fool the tourists with uh, all these different uh, stage tricks that they had that were really just, you know, it was just uh, not real, but they pretended it was real, that they were uh, the snake handlers and uh, yoga, yogi, yogis and, and, and others. And uh, he wrote about his experiences in the book uh, back in 1957 called Jadu Mysteries of the Aryan. And uh, while he was about explaining how being, you know, buried alive and uh, surviving it, of course, and uh, the Indian rope trick, and other uh, mysterious things that uh, these people would do. He also came to uh, experience some things he couldn't explain. Um, he met a, a gentleman who was a, a legendary holy man over there. Um, he was actually seeking him out, and, and somehow, rather mysteriously, I think he, he sought him out and introduced himself to Keel and. Uh, he actually proved to Keel that he could read his mind. He'd been noticing when he visited different temples that the the, uh, the people there uh, would know uh, what was going on in the neighboring village, even though they had no way of uh, communicating, no phones, no radios. Uh, they lived a very private existence. My interest in this peak when, you know, <coughs> He began writing uh, some of his magazine articles. Even before his books came out, I began writing Keel personally back in, uh, in uh, October of 1969. And uh, I had a, a little mimeograph newsletter at the time as a teenager that I had called Scientific Saucerites Review. And I would send it to Keel, and he would send me uh, a newsletter he started called Anomaly. And although a lot of people have focused on woo-woo parts of what they considered woo-woo of Keel, the, the very strange theories that he had. He was all he was really very uh, very skeptical of a lot of things and uh, tried to introduce professionalism and integrity in the field. And um, you know I one of the things was uh, the Barum Cloud experiments. He pointed that out back in 71 in his novel newsletter that a lot of UFO sightings provided a lot of detailed information were actually being caused by barren cloud experiments that were sent up from Wallops Island in Virginia and other locations. And, and, and uh, I think I know when he started to think of this because he had seen something described in Operation Georgia Bus, these various lights, uh, while driving on the Long Island Freeway at about 8 o'clock on uh, October 4th, 1967. And uh, the same thing was seen by me up in Hull, Maine, on the same day, around the same time. And I thought we were having an invasion. It was off to the south, and it turned out it was uh, this barren cloud experiment where they send these uh, uh, barren materials up into the atmosphere to study the uh, magnetic fields and so on. And so Keel was uh, ahead of his, his times in many ways in studying quantum physics, the paranormal. He even made a statement that was, of course, quite controversial at the time that uh, he felt that evolution in large part should be a branch of parapsychology. And as a, as a young teenager, he would, you know, I asked him, what, did, what should I do? How should I approach this subject? Um, and he said that uh, I should go ahead and uh, study apparitional phenomena. He mentioned a parapsychologist by the name of Terrell who had a book out called Apparitions. And uh, he said there were a lot of similarities, a lot of people, and I've verified this sense myself in, in investigating really solid cases where uh, people would report UFOs appearing to be a structured solid craft and they would go into hillside or travel right through trees. Uh, Jacques Valley, uh, well-known French-born uh, uh, scientist, uh, astronaut physicist and, and uh, astronomer, and computer uh, expert, uh, has uh, often been praised by the UFO community uh, for his work to bring about understanding that this is a real phenomena, but uh, he had written back in the 60s, uh, Anatomy of a Phenomena and uh, Challenge to Science, and then in 1969, before Keel's uh, revolutionary uh, uh, Operation Trojan was, and Strange Creatures in Time and Space came out with all of his strange theories, uh, Valley came out with a theory or a book, I should say, uh, exploring very similar things uh, called Passport to Magonia. 
and in it he compared uh, the historical, uh, comprehensive, uh, global historical uh, reference to very similar type UFO manifestations, uh, uh, the fairy faith, uh, elementals, and, and the very same things that Keel was uh, delving into as well. And anyway, that uh, Keel had suggested studying some of the medical literature and uh, uh, some of the Marian apparitions and things and, and uh, to get a grasp of it before I even began to just you know, delve into it further myself. And I, you know, I just feel like if it hadn't been for Keel, I probably wouldn't still have been at it. But here's a copy of my book. I'm uh, actually at Bender's table uh, here with the Mothman uh, statue out there. But um, Keel, as you can see, a uh, photojournalist, and uh, he had quite a reputation. And there's a whole lot more about his background than what's listed here. He, was, uh, he started writing when he was just 14. Uh, he's Started in writing a column called Scraping the Keel for his local Perry, Perry Herald in Perry, New York. Uh, he was already, a, a, he called himself a, a very ravenous reader, or that's not really the expression he was, but he just constantly was reading all kinds of books, magic, aviation, science, uh, 14 material, uh, which was a gentleman by the name of Charles Ford who passed away in 1932 who had written four books on unexplained phenomena, it often involved aerial phenomena, uh, uh, strange paranormal, or uh, even uh, frogs and snakes and things falling from the clear sky. And he uh, had some ideas that uh, maybe there was something similar to what Keel had come to speculate, that we were property, that there was something, there was something to this, some, some sort of interactive intelligence that we uh, weren't accounting for. Uh, but Keel, professionally, he was a uh, science editor at one time, a bunch of Wagner's encyclopedia, and then a foreign radio correspondent, Paris, Berlin, Rome, Egypt. Uh, he had traveled extensively early in his, he was in his 20s. And uh, he had two honorary PhD degrees in herpetology and archaeology. And uh, Quite an accomplishment for a gentleman who, when he was only 17, he decided that he wanted to be a writer, make his mark on the world, and he left Perry, New York, with, um, I uh, believe, a small box, <laughs> as Steve's told me, and 75 cents in his uh, pocket, or pockets, and uh, he made a several hundred mile uh, hitchhiking to New York City to do this. Uh, the thing with Keel is that, um, while he was skeptical, he was in fact a lifelong atheist, he came to believe from his research and the study of what he found around Point Pleasant was with the Mothman and the MIB and all the other strange novels, paranormal occurrences that, that uh, he became you know, investigated here. Uh, he began to believe that uh, there was an intelligence. At one time, you know, I, as I say, I've been corresponding and I'm talking on the phone and I asked him about uh, some of the angel reports. I say, some people feel these are good. Uh, these are a blessing. And he said, no, in the end, he felt they all turned sour. So this was, this was his perspective. Uh, he never really budged from it. He felt that the, these beings, they were similar to what the occultists called the elementals, uh, maybe similar to what the Muslims called the jinn beings that uh, had traditions go back centuries, many different cultures, they could shape shift, they could cause the missing time effect, uh, they could uh, you know, present you in one place and then take, you know, take you to another place, so they could appear and disappear, they could abduct people, uh, do many of the things that happen in modern alien abductees and things. So it's a, it's, a, it's a big area to really focus, uh, a lot of people, because didn't like the ideas, they wanted to simplify it and uh, keep it silly, nuts and bolts, uh, you know, visitation from extraterrestrials, but he was saying that he felt a lot of that was a, was a cover. Um, this gentleman here, uh, Hacken Blockovich, uh, he actually provided the, the picture of Keel who visited him in October 1976 uh, on the cover of uh, a book, which I was going to go back to. Anyway, Thank you. 
Yeah, that was actually taken on a picture. He was standing with two other people, one on each side, over in Sweden, during a visit in '76 with uh, this researcher named Hackman Blankovich, who's about my age, and he's been studying all this for many years, and uh, uh, he really believed that a lot of Thiel's ideas had a, a great deal of significance, and he found very similar things in his own work. He was saying that uh, they even had a, a case with a, a, a young couple over there in, in Sweden who on October 30th, 1965, um, one of the experiences they had was these little men that were floating up off the ground and around the car with glowing red eyes, so just like Mothman. And um, one of his buddies uh, came over from Sweden in 1969 and 1970 and spent several weeks meeting about 30 of the Mothman experiences, and um, as well as Mary Heyer, the local uh, reporter in, in this area who uh, worked with the Athens Messenger and had an office here in Point Pleasant, and uh, worked with, with, uh, with John Keel. And uh, he, um, he found that you know, when he first came here, he thought, maybe this is like, uh, he thought about getting a net. He thought maybe he could throw a net over this thing if he could find it, but he realized pretty soon that the, the situation was far more complex and perplexing than just a, a biological creature, you know, that you could throw a net over. There was, he talked to people who had seen this thing stretch out its arms and then just shoot up in the air. Uh, instead of flapping its wings, it just extended them. Um, there were people who, all of the people had this fixation on the, 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 the shining red eyes. Uh, they were very disturbed by this, and he talked to the people that knew them and said that they're not the same people, uh, you know, now that they were before this happened. They had been changed. Uh, and many times these, these eyes, and these, these red, shiny, uh, whatever they were, that was kind of where the eyes should have been, um, they would uh, cause the person almost to become entranced. One person uh, in Kiel's, uh, Kiel wrote about one person who went outside his house one night and uh, came back about 15 minutes later and uh, his wife said, you look like you've just seen a ghost, what's wrong with you? And what had happened was, is he said he got out there and there was one of these, these creatures and its eyes fixated on him and uh, he just stood there entranced until finally um, it moved away and, and the spell was broken. And many people had this kind of experience. I, when I was here in 76, I talked with a, a Virginia Thomas, whose husband, Ralph, worked out at the, uh, uh, used to be in the TNT area. It's, uh, at the time it was, what do they call it? They went Clinton, Clinton Wildlife. Sorry. And, um, Anyway, it started one day in November of 67. Uh, there was like a storm coming up. And they had some motorcycles out there, so she was going to go out to cover them up. And there was um, this man-like figure, about six, seven feet tall. And I got to talk with her about this. And she said that it, uh, it ran across the field like lightning. And it made this sound like, like uh, Fan, broken fan bell. And I said it took my thoughts and I couldn't take my eyes off it. My ears were popping, making a popping, cracking sound, like air pressure had changed or something. And um, after she thought about it, after the experience, she, she was pretty convinced that she'd encountered a robot. Uh, Keel had written in Strange Creatures from Time and Space that he knew of two instances where people had reported the, the, the Mothman flying overhead which Mothman was actually uh, something that the newsman had come up with uh, calling it Mothman. Before that, people were calling it Bird. And, you know, Batman was popular at that time, so here we have Mothman. But um, there were two witnesses that claimed that they heard, like, uh, some kind of a humming or mechanical sound from when the creature flew overhead. In the 1990s, I wrote Keel, and uh, he told me that he was no longer interested in Mothman, that these things had been reported by thousands worldwide, that uh, Point Pleasant wasn't the only location 
I recently um, uh, interviewed a lady who said that she had um, seen a Mothman type thing down in Florida some years ago after the, the incidents here in, in West Virginia and uh, said there was a tragedy uh, around that same time too with a, a bridge uh, where a, uh, a barge struck the bridge and caused some death, uh, knocking some, uh, a vehicle or two into the, into the water. Um, I know some people have perceived it as an omen. I'm not sure how often, I know there's stories out there, I don't know how often that sort of thing has, has happened. But um, Keel is interested in, in uh, not just the Mothman, but all sorts of paranormal and all those type, type phenomena. Rosemary Godley, Chris was going to be a tribute later uh, about her. She she knew Keel uh, quite well. She used to meet him in uh, New York City where he lived, and uh, they would talk. They'd have lunch. She also became a member of uh, the 14 Society that Keel had started around the 20th anniversary of the uh, UFO phenomena that started with Kenneth Arnold back in 1947. Um, that's another story in itself. But um, they had many people who would come and speak. Uh, uh, there was uh, many different ufologists. One of them, uh, Michael Grosso and Tim Beckley, who interviewed in, in my book. And um, she felt that Keel was um, very much ahead of his time, that uh, we were all kind of standing on his shoulders, and that uh, although he never said so, that um, he was actually someone who um, her, his ideas resonated very strongly with her own. She had had a lot of experiences herself. She was coming with very similar conclusions. Um, and um, when I approached her about the book, she helped me a lot. She wrote the forward. I did an interview with her as well. And uh, I, you know, she unfortunately, she had, we found out later, had cancer and was not able to, uh, uh, you know, publish the book for me. So I ended up publishing it myself on Amazon. It came out July 14th. And uh, sadly, uh, Rosemary passed on July 19th. And she, she had told me that um, you know this was very important, the Mothman Festival, that uh, there was always the latest information and, and, and great speakers would come and, and do presentations on, on new findings or a background of, of these, these the, you know, other cases, what happened here, other similar things elsewhere. And uh, she said that she never would miss being here for the Mothman Festival uh, you know, unless something dire happened, and sadly it did. And uh, she shared in her forward uh, this picture of, of Keel. One of her favorite memories, she said, uh, Keel uh, did a tour back in the 90s with, uh, with her. And they, they uh, did a Sacred Sites over in England tour. And she said, here's Keel, uh, crafty smile on his face, looking like a man of mystery among the mysteries. And that was John. And this was uh, actually Keel's first book, uh, Jedu, Mysteries of the Orient, published back in 1957. <clears throat> and uh, this statement right here was from a, a very well-known master magician in the New York Times called Ben Robinson. He, would, uh, he was actually very familiar with Keel, a friend of his, and uh, praised his, his work. Here's a picture of Keel back in 1955 when he was over in, uh, over in the, the east there. And he was doing a snake ch uh, charming thing, a uh, cobra. Uh, first, the, the cobra's teeth were removed. It's not actually the flute he's playing isn't actually what's causing the snake to go back and forth. It was the movement of Keel's hands, all part of the, the illusion. And Keel had pointed out, you know, like here's some periods where it was unusual poltergeist activity correlated with on this chart going back into the 1800s of uh, 
novelist phenomena in the sky in connection with the poltergeist, the Hani events, and noticed the similar graph. Hill felt that a lot of these things were intimately interconnected. And this lady here, who was, um, was one of John Hill's literary agents, uh, for the last there, said uh, he was one of her favorite authors, and uh, she actually negotiated sale of his book, Complete Guide to Mysterious Beings, the Double Day. And uh, she, she said he was a really great writer. That's what drew her to him. And uh, what, was, what was really, really interesting was that um, she said she told people that she had three great writers, and she called them her grumpy bear authors. And it was uh, John Keel, and uh, it was uh, uh, Ingo Swan, who was best known for his remote viewing work, a New York artist. They all lived in New York City. Uh, along with Alex Emark, who was a parapsychologist uh, who originated from Poland. And, uh, and anyway, she said they were, they were all exceptional in their fields, and uh, she did her best to help them, and that uh, she just felt like they were kind of on the grumpy side because a lot of times they, they would get criticized for their, their stunning work, which she believed in. And, uh, but anyway, one day, um, Ingo Swan was having a, a uh, somebody that was supposed to be a psychic come to his home and gonna have a demonstration in this big room in his basement. They had reporters there. John Keel was invited as a special guest to sit up front along with, uh, along with uh, the literary agent here, uh, Sandra Martin. And <clears throat> now remember, Keel was, uh, was pretty good at magic. And uh, so as it began, this, this guy that's supposed to be sighted from some foreign country raised his arms and hands out like this. This object started to lay, raising up into the air between his hands. <coughs> At that point, Keel leaned over and tapped Sandra and said, we've got to get out of here now. And she's clueless what's going on. And she's just, the demonstration just started. So they get out on the sidewalk and uh, <coughs> she said, okay, John, what's this about? And he says, I don't want your reputation or mine tarnished. There's reporters there. All we need is to have someone snap our picture. Said, I can take you down a few blocks to a magic shop and I can teach you the same trick in five minutes. You know. And this was, she said, this was John Keel. You know, he was all about trying to establish what is real and what is not. And uh, it was all the time he kind of characterized just too move and out there, but he really was uh, quite serious and he also had a skeptical side. And, uh, it's all about trying to get the truth. Now, <clears throat> what Keel didn't know at this time was that that Tim Frick right there is an MIB. And uh, there he is right there. <laughs> and uh, he's also in my book. I have a chapter where I interview Tim about, uh, about you know, his, when he and his brother John became interested in the Mothman and started coming here and, and uh, talking with people and reading extensively on this. They actually came and met Keel, spent about eight hours with him in, uh, in 2013, Mothman Festival. And uh, I think that experience was, was quite, a, quite a thing. They, they have helped me in writing the book <coughs> to get certain things that they discussed with Keel and clarified. Some skeptics were probably pointing out, you know, some things that, uh, <clears throat> that uh, Linda Skyberry had put crucifixes on the wall of the house because there were strange things going on and, and somebody pointed out, well, that was Keel's idea, you know. Keel was supposed to be such a skeptic. And they talked to him about that and found out that he had said that he thought that that might comfort them in a kind of a placebo effect. You know, that wasn't that he himself necessarily believed in, in it, but that he thought that this was strategy and it made them feel better. So anyway, uh, <clears throat> you also had an experience that I, I found out about that had never been published before that Noah, but 
uh, John and Tim talked with, with Keel about this, and I had talked with someone else about this, and so I got confirmation from them about it too. That there was a longtime friend of Keel that showed up at his uh, apartment in New York City on, uh, <clears throat> on uh, let's see, it was December 15th, 1967. This was exactly 13 months after uh, after the incident uh, with uh, the two couples in, in the TNT area, the Mothman. And this, of course, was the night that the Silver Bridge collapsed. Uh, Keel was in front of the TV expecting that something was going to happen. He wasn't really sure what, and then this came out. And of course, there have been people having precognitive impressions of uh, some of the witnesses where they were seeing like Christmas packages floating in the river. And it was on that night, as he's watching the TV, that uh, he felt that there was actually, he thought it was going to be some kind of power blackout, but it turned out to be this. <clears throat> what he doesn't tell you in, in the Mothman prophecies is that uh, this longtime friend of his showed up in his apartment and was sitting there watching the TV when this happened. And uh, they had spent several hours together that day. He just showed up. And then later he meets the, uh, uh, this man's wife and says, oh, I saw your husband. And uh, said, you know, when it was, and she said, no, um, no, John, you've got to be mistaken. I said, he passed away uh, over two years before that. He had a heart attack. I said, are you sure? She got upset with John at that point, uh, saying, that, no, no, he don't you think I would know is that I was with my husband who died? Uh, there's no question about it. And uh, so when, <clears throat> when uh, later on, when I think it was John that spoke to him right here uh, about it and was questioning him about how he felt about it, Keel made the statement that uh, it, it was something that uh, hurt his brain too much, really, or his mind, to uh, really dwell on it. Uh, it was very disturbing. And he told my informant about this, and the guy shared a letter where he even put all this down, uh, that he preferred not, not to be identified, but uh, he knew Keel quite well. It was there in the apartment at the time. And uh, he said he was a big guy with a tall handshake, and that, uh, uh, you know, he didn't suspect anything unusual. Keel was wrote to this guy, and in the letter he said that uh, he's had many sleepless nights since this happened. You know, he discovered that his friend was dead. He said he had his memories, he had his voice, he had his appearance. He said, in all respects, this was my friend. He said, you know, and remember, Keel was a lifelong atheist, so this really, really bugged him. Uh, this is Alex Emuk, um, and I said the Polish American parapsychologist. He lived to be 111 years old. Uh, when he passed, I was hearing about it on the national news on TV. Uh, he was um, a bit of a health nut, um, and he, he, he was still uh, living in his apartment when he passed. Um, and uh, he was quite well known in Paranormal, but he was the one who brought the um, the supposed psychic to Ingo, you know, to uh, yeah, Ingo Swan's home for the psychic demonstration, and Doug Skinner, who was Keel's good friend, told me that he had uh, actually, I guess after this, had spoken with uh, Alex about the fact that uh, you need to be kind of careful. There's a lot of fake people out there too. In addition to the genuine psychics, you need to know a little more about magic tricks. And Keel felt, uh, Doug Skinner said, that all, all paranormal investigators should have some knowledge of uh, the trickery and the magic that would be involved, magic tricks. And here's Ingo Swan, the man who worked with uh, the remote viewing programs at Stanford Research Institute. Here's a picture of Doug Skinner. I, uh, I kind of think of the a variety of people at the 14 organizations mentioned about the 14 fests. 
where people would gather at these 14 meetings uh, around Maryland, Virginia, and of course in New York. And he said, where else could you party with 14 skeptics, Christians, pagans, cryptozoologists, and cultists? So I also had a good time drawing a cartoon from the cover of his booklet, Flying Saucer Subculture, an official publication of the New York 14 Society. John insisted there had to be a straight jacket at a propeller meeting. And uh, you know, that was one of the great things about Keel was his, his sense of humor, even though he uh, was very much in serious about these things. <clears throat> oh yeah, this was when I was in the Navy. And uh, I was in Karachi, Pakistan at a zoo, and uh, Keel loved snakes and stuff, snake reptiles. And he actually had snakes in cages in his New York City apartment, which people thought was pretty unusual. <coughs> but since childhood, he had uh, always been fascinated by the reptile world. And uh, back in July, there were two night watchmen in uh, Karachi that reported a large black cat with going eyes. I haven't heard any more details on that, but uh, to Keel, it was a strange mixture of Asia and the Middle East. I got to see some of the cobras being enchanted by the uh, flu lines over there. <coughs> I was very fortunate to meet Dan Crazy. He was uh, born and raised in New York City. He, um, he actually was uh, a film producer, and he's produced a film called Calling Earth, which is now available on, on YouTube. It's open hour long. He's traveled around the world investigating EDP and ITC phenomena, you know, the audio and video images of ghosts and such. And I had, you know, I remember there was a Dan Drazen mentioned in uh, several times in Mothman Prophecy, well, this is the guy. I, I had uh, found out uh, that a little about his work that he was studying this stuff, this paranormal electronics and things. And he was over in, uh, <clears throat> the Netherlands investigating a gentleman who claimed that he uh, was photographing dead people. And uh, Nancy Tolbert from Cambridge, New York, said he photographed her brother. There was no way that he could have got these images of other than dead. And he did this for other people, too. So Dan went over, and he had all these controls set up to safeguard against deception. And he claimed that in spite of all that, uh, they still got anomalous images. One was a face of a gentleman who had been, he felt, uh, the face of uh, a man who had been an early EVP researcher himself over, uh, over in a big sweep. <coughs> and this is the gentleman here that actually came to Point Pleasant back in 1969 and, and 1970 and uh, spent several weeks, actually uh, began to have romantic feelings for uh, Linda Scarberry, uh, the, uh, the group over in Sweden, uh, uh, actually, they have an archive organization over there, a group that, uh, where they collect information from all over the world, the paranormal and UFO nature. <coughs> he was part of that. Hagen Walker is very involved in it today. And uh, he came over and interviewed about 30 people, had a strong connection with uh, uh, Mary Heyer. And uh, Keel wrote him a letter of introduction to the people of uh, Point Pleasant, and he said it opened many doors. And he did an interview in 1973, which uh, is included in my book, where he talks about these, these people and, and how they were so traumatized. <coughs> and um, he said they all became smokers. They, had said they were so nervous. And, and, uh, and sometimes he'd ask them, are you sure you want to tell me this experience? see if they were really upset. And they said, no, we want, to, we want to tell us, share this with you. And um, it was always the eyes that seemed to, to affect them the most. John Keel would uh, talk about Jacques Lee, he said he was his ghostwriter, because initially Jacques Lee and, and others were rather skeptical of John Keel's ideas, and then as they began to look at it further and deeper themselves, they began to share similar ideas, and that's the case with Valley. And 
Yeah, that's a little bit what I've already talked about there. But anyway, here's Keel and Valley, two giants in the field together. Valley is still still alive and with us and contributing to further ongoing research. <coughs> and here's uh, Keel's other, I mean, uh, Valley's other ghost rider that's me. Just kidding, just kidding. Um, and this is Michael Grosso, uh, PhD. Uh, he's in the book. I interviewed him about about Keel. He spoke at Keel's uh, 14 uh, society meetings in New York City. Here's uh, Keel's good friend Ivan T. Sanderson, um, who is a, uh, well known for his work in cryptozoology, investigating, and writing a book on the Abominable Snowman. And he also wrote a couple of books on UFOs. And here he is with. Um, in Keel's apartment in New York City with a, showing Keel an illustration of these beads seen up around Hopkinsville, Kentucky back in August of 1955, where a, a family uh, was terrified uh, after uh, someone moved outside to get a, uh, a well to fetch some water. And they saw this thing come down out of the sky and went running to the house with a UFO, UFO, and, and all the next thing they knew that these uh, small beads that actually glowed. And um, when the police got there later, the house was just riddled with uh, uh, bullet holes. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, to this day, it's still a, a like the Mothman Festival here. Uh, they have a, an annual event each August uh, up there in, in uh, that area near Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Uh, commemorators, and they bring in speakers and talk about this. And the daughter of uh, 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 Geraldine Sutton, she's, uh, she's written two books about this incident. She, she's had since then some unusual experiences herself, but she interviewed her family and gathered materials, clippings and things, and uh, produced two books about what her family experienced, uh, which she says was very, very real. Um, and then the Sumerian apparitions, you know, Keel felt that, as well as Valley, that there was a lot of similarity here with, with uh, Marian apparitions. Uh, there were thousands of people here at this event uh, from 1968 to 1970 outside Cairo, Egypt, in a small community known as Zaitan. I have a friend of mine, Dr. Greg Lowell, a psychologist, who went over there and uh, went to this church where this actually, um, let me see right this is supposed to be the Virgin Mary. It's like a halo, a glow around it, kind of a plasma type thing. It also affected the, the structure itself, the dome. And so it lasts generally the apparitions from 15 minutes to eight hours at a time. Literally hundreds of thousands of people witness the apparitions uh, with thousands of photographs and videotape taken. Um, and this is a quote from my friend, Dr. Greg Little. And, uh, and early on, back in his 1970 book, Strange Creatures in Time and Space, uh, Keel wrote that, you know, uh, are UFOs alien or are they ghosts? He said, you know, take your pick. Uh, there's so many correlations. This is, of course, what Keel told me. Study the apparitions, study the, the variations. Uh, you know, it's, it's a matter of, like, uh, I'd say in the book that uh, Steve and, and uh, Joy Medea are going to be writing and working on together the uh, parallels and patterns. And we're going to go through the, you know, the different historical events, the different kinds of events, and find that there are commonalities that in, in all of these. And, uh, and let's see, one of the things I would like to get into is the, uh, there's another picture. They also had these very large uh, birds. They thought they were doves, but they were large and the regular doves appeared. Uh, you know, they also had strange lights, orbs, whatever, that appeared. And people actually photographed them, still pictures as well as motion pictures. And this is a picture of my friend, Dr. Will. He helps me with uh, my online magazine, Alternate Perceptions. 
And this is a this is a case from October of 1973 involving uh, a helicopter incident, often called the Coin Incident. Uh, these were three uh, Army reservists who were flying a helicopter in Ohio from, <clears throat> um, as I recall, it was from Columbus up to around the Cleveland area, and a uh, UFO appeared and. Uh, they had radio interference, uh, actually the loss of radio communication, and uh, they were trying to avoid a collision, and they dove down, and um, there was actually some people on the ground that said they observed this as well. And what was interesting is afterwards, someone from the Pentagon was contacting them, asking them, were they having unusual dreams or experiences of separation from the physical body? And, one of them uh, said, yeah, I've had a, or two of them actually, coined and another person who was on board um, that uh, felt that he left his body and it, it kind of scared him. And of course the paranormal element has become quite, you know, it's quite well known to Keel and, and there's a lot of indications that the, um, the government has also been exploring this, you know, as part of the, the puzzle. And, uh, and here's the illustration of the object that they saw. It was uh, pretty good size. It cast a beam of light, a green beam that lit up the interior of the helicopter. <clears throat> and this is, again, the bearing apparition of the Lady of Fatima in Portugal. It was described by some of the witnesses, and uh, mostly children. Um, and these are UFO beings with small balls of light that would direct the energy and sometimes the balls of light would levitate, move around. Uh, um, actually, I think they kind of controlled the consciousness again, the consciousness element. And what was interesting to me is I found uh, two people I had spoken with in, uh, a few years ago. The same year I, I talked with them, they had an encounter with a humanoid that had this uh, ball light energy whatever that, that came out of their left hand and could levitate and, and, uh, and one guy who was a hunter said this uh, in that case it was like a silvery ball and it came up out of the guy's the being's hand a silver being he was out hunting in new york and it uh, came up to him just a few inches from his face and then he lost consciousness and next thing he was picking himself up off the ground and there was no sign of anything unusual at that point. And uh, I did some research and I found out there's a number of these. And so um, I noticed uh, people, psychics, contactees having what I call hemisphere brain shifts. Um, ordinarily, say they're, they're right-handed, but suddenly they're in trance and they're writing with the left hand. Or uh, other things happen that indicate a hemisphere shift. And there's another from Argentina uh, being with a civil object in the left hand. And there's a gentleman I talked with, Johnny Sands, an entertainer, singer, stuntman, and there's a national man who uh, had this experience outside of Las Vegas uh, back in 1976. And there was uh, this object that grew in size from like the size of a grapefruit to a basketball covering in the air. And there were explosions on it. And uh, he was given a message about, you know, warning us about uh, our carelessness with nuclear energy, nuclear weapons, which frequently comes up out of the contact experience. And here's one in Finland. Um, these two men had this experience of being, as they were skiing down this mountain, classic dome, disc shaped object, being is seen, suddenly it seems to just shoot up into the craft. Afterwards, one of them says on two different occasions, this uh, alien woman approached him and uh, had an uh, object in the left hand that uh, uh, could levitate and such. So that's just very interesting. Uh, this is a woman among about three dozen women back in 77, 78 who claimed they were burned by beams from uh, UFOs in, in Brazil, and uh, ages 18 to 50, and uh, this was on an island um, at the mouth of the Amazon. 
Jacques Lilly investigated this, and Bob Pratt investigated this. Uh, a, a reporter who had been to, I interviewed him, he'd been to uh, Brazil uh, about 14 times. He had since passed, but uh, I got to interview him, five interviews in my book, Visitors from Hidden Realms. Uh, it's very unusual that uh, some of the, this, you know, most, most cases of UFO encounters don't have this, this kind of uh, uh, interaction. Most times people see a craft, and a lot of times it's frightening psychologically, or it's, you know, they accept it as, as a good experience, almost religious, but not the injuries. And uh, the injury cases are, are quite interesting to uh, a number of people who have worked in, in the government. Uh, and, and one is uh, Christopher K. Green, who uh, was working in the weird desk at Langley in the CIA back in 19. 72, and, and uh, he and another doctor, uh, Gary Nolan, had uh, spoken back in November 30th of last year at the uh, uh, Harvard Medical School. And they're interested in these kind of cases, and uh, they've got military people who have been hit by beams of light and such, and, and they're, they're going to come out with a report, they said, right here, and they're just interested in the fact that they believe, like Keel kind of believed, that there's. Uh, some of these people are having reoccurring experiences and something different about their brains. And they, they uh, think it's the uh, part of the brain called the uh, claudate uh, nucleus or something. It's, uh, they noticed with a sample group were not experiences and these who were experiences that uh, there was uh, an increase of neuronal intensity. And, uh, and his, Actually, Kit Green's interest, and he's still interested, uh, began when he was working with, uh, uh, actually he was asked by Richard Helms, the, uh, the director at the time of the CIA, to monitor the, the Stanford Research Institute's remote viewing program, and psychokinetic programs with Harry Geller and uh, Ingo Swan and, and Pat Price and others, and the researchers as well, keep them advised of what was happening. And um, uh, with Eric Geller, they, they, in 1974, uh, some, some nuclear scientists, engineers, had him at a, uh, a site that was 30 miles from Stanford in California, which was in uh, uh, Livermore, Lawrence Livermore Nuclear Laboratory. And uh, what happened is when these scientists were working with Geller, they would get uh, these strange, these strange visions. Um, and this is what really piqued uh, Kit Green's interest in this. Uh, these were thoroughly stable scientists, and yet they began to report when they went home in the evening. Uh, one one said that uh, he was seeing these tall, dark, bird-like figures walking through the flower garden. Uh, another man and his wife saw this uh, arm with a hook on the end just floating over there in their home. And some were reporting a uh, strange ball of light floating around. And then one, one instance where they were studying Geller, trying to you know, understand his psychokinetic ability and how it could be used for military purposes, um, actually got an EVP. And it was, and so Kit Green came and listened to it and was surprised that it gave a code name to a secret project. He knew of this, but he said no one else in that group knew of this, this code word. And so ever since then, I think that's when Kit Green decided he wanted to study this closer. And four minutes, yeah. And now I'm going to talk about uh, EVPs again, because again, Keel made the psychic connection. And uh, after he passed, you know, I, I was really sad to think that we lost uh, such a giant in the field. And I was with a, an abductee who was trying to introduce me to the, the ghost box, you know, to capture EVPs. And a lot of people feel it's kind of a subjective process. Uh, uh, sometimes you, you think you heard this or that, uh, or it's a coincidence that a certain word pops up. But here's what happened. Um, 
guy that, you know, he was an abductee, he'd been in the field, I mean, he'd been experiencing ghosts and aliens since age five. So again, there's that connection. The problem is what, what is it about making this person like an antenna? Uh, for these experiences, this proneness. And so, uh, I was thinking how sad this happened, and then suddenly working with Brett, we were on investigations of paranormal sites. And we started getting John Keel. And I wasn't a whole percent, whole 100% convinced, and I thought, okay, John Keel, he played it back, it's John Keel. But um, coming over at AM radio, and so, I got, you know, got my own um, device, a ghost box, and pretty soon I was getting very similar things. I even got John Keel Brent, Bert here, and Bert was a friend of mine and John Keels, who was a psychiatrist slash parapsychologist, and uh, they had exchanged many letters and conversations as well. And, um, and then there were things, you know, I know that some of those people say pareidolia, but we had it recorded, and there were other people there. And then one time it was, uh, uh, Brad always said to hit the session, we started with kind of like a little prayer, meditation, protection. And when we ended the session, I said clear, and instead of getting a voice back saying clear, the voice said, this, this cannot clear, this is energy. And, uh, you know, obviously this one wasn't on the same page as the other ones we've been dealing with. Didn't understand what we were talking about. We thought we were getting an, uh, a word like uh, Enoch or uh, Enoch, you know, was, was it an O or an I? We, we argued about it. So one day I, I um, asked the ghost box, I spent about three minutes, you know, is it I or an O? Enoch was an I or an O? And, voice came through, a male voice, and said, it's Enoch with an O, just like that. And I repeated it right afterwards, and I said, holy, you know, something bad, so I, but, uh, you know, it's just surprising, and uh, um, there's just a lot of anomalous things that crop out of these investigations. So you have to be open-minded, and, and uh, I think consider the broader picture. Consciousness and physics. Some real anomalies there. Anyway, thank you very much. For